Uh, so hello and welcome everybody to the first in a series of channel evolution webinars using a channel ecosystem as a go-to-market strategy. So thank you again everybody for joining us today as we uncover how the channel has evolved over the past few decades, examine the current state of the channel, and explore where the channel is headed as technology expands exponentially. We appreciate you to be a part of our conversation and we encourage you to jump in and submit your questions via the Q&A section. So starting us off in the early days, if you wanted to take advantage of the power of the channel ecosystem, you had to be an enterprise software provider. If you were a small vendor, your only real option was to join the ecosystem as an ISV partner. And the costs of setting up, managing, and scaling a channel ecosystem were so high and not all partners were the right fit. ISV partnerships often come with added costs and unique challenges of their own, such as visibility to the solutions offered to partners, the need to develop co-branded marketing and sales assets, as well as scaling within that third-party ecosystem are just a few of the main challenges partners has faced. And Gorilla knows these challenges firsthand. For the past 28 years, we've been working with vendors to develop, enable, scale, and manage channel ecosystems. We have witnessed technology and the sheer amount of software vendors explode around channel ecosystems. It's now easier than ever for mid-size and startup vendors uh, to develop and set up their own channel ecosystems at many levels of their own product maturity, from initial sales and go-to-market strategy to hybrid models that are designed to build revenue and provide visibility in the marketplace Channel ecosystems are no longer just for the billion dollar revenue vendors. Now, channel ecosystems are open to every company as a way to maximize revenue and build a solid standing in the market at any level. With over 700 technology companies entering the global market every day, how do you raise the odds in your favor to achieve measurable growth and success? In order to gather the best return on growth investments, startup vendors must take advantage of their heightened visibility, the multiple, multiple sales outlets, and accelerated go-to-market abilities that developing a channel brings. And the cost to deploy a channel is lower than ever, and these costs can be offset even more by partnering with companies like Gorilla, which reduces the need for internal hiring while providing results. Having been at the helm of Gorilla through the changes in this global arena, our first expert today, Carlo Breda, has witnessed many changes in technology, processes, and the overall economy. He's here to help us understand these changes and perhaps shed some light on what the future of channel looks like. So thank you again, Carlo, for being here. Uh, do us a favor and tell us a little bit about yourself and a little bit about the story of Gorilla. Yeah, thanks, uh, Teddy. Um, really glad to 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 be here today, and uh, to have this opportunity to, um, to share some some of my thoughts and insights, and and um, especially with regards to what you were saying, uh, the channel has undergone so many changes over these uh, last uh, three decades, and uh, and actually has pretty much the length of time that I've been in the channel and that uh, Gorilla has been around in one form or, or another. And uh, what what I, we have seen is. Uh, incredible changes uh, uh, to start with at the very beginning just to give you a little bit of history uh, my, my background was uh, in engineering i was an information systems engineer uh, focused on uh, ai and then i found uh, i discovered my love for marketing and um, business entrepreneurship and so i pivoted very quickly and um, our business initially was really a market research company um, i was extremely young and uh, trying to uh, figure out really what I wanted to do. And uh, what I noticed was uh, in, in these early years, many of the research assignments were coming from vendors and their questions were all about um, the channel, the early days of the channel. Um, the research assignments were along the lines of uh, what kind of uh, partners do you think we need in this particular geo? or what types of partners do we need for this particular new product? And uh, in these very early days of the channel, um, 
you know, we didn't have all the terminology we have now. We, there was no MSPs, MSSPs. They were all called dealers. And uh, and, and this was a very different dynamic. Um, you know, uh, the, the PC had, you know, just gone, you know, commercial, really. Uh, it was the early days of the uh, IBM PC revolution. And so everybody was, was just, there was a crazy demand economy. Everybody wanted a computer, right? And no, nobody had a computer. And so in these early days, it was really easy. And so many companies went into it. And suddenly the channel became um, became complex very, very rapidly. You know, uh, initially dealers were really, uh, you know, uh, retail outlets, uh, various kinds of B2B intermediaries um, that became, that improvised themselves as uh, assemblers and system builders. Um, and uh, the, the, the model was really not very clear um, whether, you know, how, how it was going to uh, shape um, initially, it was really a margin game, and that's all that it needed to be. There was no solution selling. There was no real need for solutions. It was, you know, produce them as fast as possible and fulfill the demand. Um, if you're assembling, you're adding value through the assembly of your uh, of the PCs. If you're uh, if you're um, reselling them, reselling HP or reselling IBM, it was really just a margin game. That didn't last that long. It lasted a few years, maybe a decade. But soon after, um, you know, saturation happened pretty quickly. And, and so but, uh, in, in the whole technology game, there's always like one wave. It's like being at the ocean. There's one big wave after, after another that comes in. And this, these are all waves of innovation. So right after the PC revolution, we had the, uh, the networking revolution. And for the dinosaurs in the room, they'll remember these early days of uh, Windows 3.1 uh, that just uh, that had the integrated sort of uh, LAN networking, Novell uh, 2.1 and 3.1 that uh, enabled the uh, initial networking of computers. And so that was the next big revolution. After that, there was a client server revolution. After that, there was the year 2000 crisis and um, and so on. And then, and then, you know, getting to where we are now, virtualization, cloud, um, uh, software-defined data centers, hyper-converged infrastructures, and now, you know, cybersecurity and AI is where we are right now. These have all been waves, consecutive waves. And the smart channel partners are quick to onboard the new wave, right? And that's what I was thinking in, in terms of, um, you know, the, the response to your initial question really is the, is the fact that uh, Although there have been incredible changes to the dynamics of the market and to the ways that channel partners behave and interact. And remember that there's two facets to this. So there's the relationship between the channel partners and the vendors and the relationship between the channel partners and, and the customers, the end users. And th those are two very different dynamics. But insofar as uh, the, the power dynamics of these two relationships, um, the channel has always been very good at making sure that they were uh, adapting uh, to always remain uh, relevant uh, to the customers, to the end users. And they did that firstly by moving quickly into the new innovation trend. So the quicker, the, the ones that were the fastest to move were the ones to actually reap the rewards of that growth. Um, so that, that's one thing that's I think really important is uh, to, to realize is relevance is incredibly important, the relevance to the end user. Um, the speed, uh, the agility, really, of the partner to adapt uh, to new technologies, um, and um, and 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 then, of course, uh, uh, the ability of the partner to uh, find a way to add value. So this has been, if you want, another one of the big trends of the last three decades. Is back has been that incredible move um, that has been persistent, really, since the early days when the dealers started calling themselves resellers and then VARs, right? Value add resellers. With the, the intention of that move, of that relabeling was to show that they, they, are, they are able to add value, not just to shift the box. That process is still happening today. Uh, we've been conducting surveys into the channel for, again, for decades. And uh, as, as we do these uh, surveys every few years, the indicators don't change really. The theme ultimately, fundamentally remains the same in that uh, the channel partners always seek to find more service uh, opportunities, more service attach rate opportunities, because there's always a diminishing uh, margin 
uh, as as technologies uh, mature, the margins diminish to negligible. But of course, the brand new technologies come in to replace them at a higher margin, right? So that's the game: is adapting to new technologies to try to retain and conquer the greater margins, whilst at the same time um, increasing the amount of services uh, that you can provide. Um, and that's uh, in in a nutshell. I think th these are the initial observations that I would say of uh, how I've seen the channel change over over the decades. Um, I, I'm fascinated by by this business. Uh, I love being in uh, in in the middle of uh, of, of uh, this uh, uh, sphere of uh, channel uh, analytics. Uh, it brings in all of the things I'm fascinated that I find fascinating. Um, it's relationships, human relationships, uh, managing human relationships, um, managing uh, uh, empathy, uh, feeling empathy with the partners, um, understanding uh, the perspectives from the end users. Uh, it's a highly psychological uh, line of business to be in. Um, yeah, Jill, would you like to add something on that? Uh, no, um, I'm going to react a little bit to it uh, just by saying, yeah, there's there's been definitely an evolution in the past uh, 20, 30 years of uh, what, what we call channels, uh, and which I'll try to refer not as channels today, but more as a partnership ecosystems. Um, because it has vastly evolved and it's not just, you know, we need to find a reseller as a vendor, uh, even though it's the, the default reaction that most new vendors um, have on the market. It's, it's, it, it extends far beyond that. Um, what uh, the emphasis I'll put on what Carlo just said is on, is on the proliferation of vendors, right? This has completely changed the dynamic on how those uh, partnerships are being formed today, uh, not to the benefit of the vendors and certainly not to the benefit of the new vendors, of the little ones, uh, the startups, the scale-ups. Um, and the other thing that has dramatically evolved uh, where partnership ecosystems are extremely important is what we refer to as the customer journey, right? This has dramatically changed uh, to a point that uh, you know, uh, as uh, Jay McBain, who's probably uh, my icon when it comes to uh, channel knowledge and all that from, from Forrester and Canalys, I don't know which one is that today, but probably one of the best experts in, in um, ecosystems, partnership ecosystem in the world says, how do we bring together, together being the vendor and its ecosystem of partners, how do we bring customers to the dance? And I, how do we more importantly, because we're moving towards an economy where uh, everything is based on recurring sales today, right? Subscription-based uh, selling. Uh, how do we keep them buying from us right? uh, all the time? So the, this is this is the big the big transition that we've been following through the different aspect of technology that Carlo mentioned, uh, including you know virtualization, including uh, transition to the cloud, and all those type of things. On top of what Carlo said. I'll leave it there and let you ask your question uh, later, Ted. Yeah, no, I appreciate that very much. Um, I wanted to also give you a chance to introduce yourself and, and give a little bit sure. of background about yourself. And um, of course, we uh, we appreciate you being here. So thank you. Well, thank you for having me. And uh, uh, so, in all disclosure, before uh, before we go any further, the reason one of the reason why I'm here is because uh, through different vendors in the past and 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 other things I've been uh, involved with as a partnership with Gorilla, who has been supporting uh, some of the companies where I was uh, leading channels uh, to help with some initiatives uh, to launch new product or to uh, uh, start some specific campaigns um, and so on and so forth with uh, our partners. Um, so uh, I have a high respect for the company because they've done uh, a tremendously good and even more tremendously difficult job, given the level of channel readiness of the companies I was at at the time. Uh, and uh, my uh, my background is, uh, you know, just like many other people, while I'm coming from Europe, I came to the US 20 years ago. Prior to that time, I went to a business school, blah, blah, blah. Uh, spent a lot of time all over the world. Uh, I majored in international trade for, you know, preferences, but ended up in sales. And I did my first, uh, my first 200 years was in sales. 
And uh, then I moved to the US and this is where I discovered the channel uh, or what we refer to as the channel like partnering. And I started to work at uh, distributors uh, 20 years ago uh, and then at different roles at vendors and uh, channel, even partners like reseller of ours, um, this type of environment. So I've, I've seen every aspect of the traditional resale channel, as you can imagine it, uh, and started as, you know, inside sales and then moved to channel management and then move to uh, channel management as in managing partners and then channel management as in managing teams of uh, channel managers and then move to, you know, position as we refer sometimes as channel chief or like organizing the strategy uh, and all the aspects related to partnerships, alliances, resellers, distribution, et cetera, et cetera, was uh, various vendors. Uh, all of them in technology, uh, a, a mass majority, a big majority of them in uh, the storage industry uh, till about uh, year 2010, 11, and then switch to cybersecurity. Uh, and I've been in cybersecurity since then. So that's it. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you for that. Um, appreciate the background. And uh, again, thank you both for being here and for, for sharing your perspectives. Um, so Carlo, I know we already kind of touched on how you've seen the channel evolve over the past 30 years. Um, you've kind of broken that down into a little nutshell for us. Um, so I wanted to follow up with you, Jill. Um, in your opinion, what do you see as the biggest challenge for smaller vendors, not today, but 25 years ago? Well, the uh, having worked at that time with very, very big vendors such as Itachi and, and, and the likes of Itachi, uh, Itachi Data Systems at the time, uh, Noah Ventara, the biggest vendor for for smaller partners, right, uh, was to get the ear of those big vendors. Everybody who was interested in working was IBM, Dell, EMC, you know, NetApp, Microsoft, all these guys, right? And uh, the only one at the time that really had an ear for small partners was was like to a different level than the other. I'm not saying the other didn't have that, but. Uh, Microsoft was the only one that was very open in, in deploying like a huge partner ecosystem as it translates to their the, the current ecosystem they have today. All the others were very, very picky in, in what partners they were going to take, right? And everybody, um, which is a constant, still wanted to work with the big dogs, right? And vice versa. And uh, so it was very difficult for little partners to be able to appeal to a company like Dell or Itachi and all that. And uh, at the time, uh, there was a lot of screening. Uh, was the, uh, the unicorn that every vendor followed, which was to say, I want the right partner. And I'm putting this in air quotes because what defines the right partner uh, is not only the size of that partner or how many customers they have and how well connected they are with those customers and all that the equation and the dynamic for a vendor and their channel management team and a partner, uh, whatever that partner is, is far more complex than just size, you know, connections and, and those type of things. Uh, it's far more than that. But yet uh, we were screening because <clears throat> we had absolutely zero problem uh, to recruit partners. Uh, we built uh, between Avnet and Itachi very, very quickly an ecosystem of partners uh, that was absolutely incredible when it comes to the size of it, the sure size of it, right, uh, at the time. Um, today, that dynamic has, has changed a little bit, and I'm sure we'll talk about that later, but the, the way I see it for small partners is summarized by this. Yeah, it was extremely difficult at the time for them to have a value proposition as a reseller, as a VAR, to go to a Dell and say, we're the right guys for you because we can do this X, Y, Z things and that kind of stuff. And we're going to increase your sell and help you go in market where you can go by yourself or your other partners can go, right? Uh, that, that's what it was. Okay. And that's a personal opinion, by the way. So, No, that was great. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. That was interesting um, about Microsoft, you know, how they were the ones initially going after all those partners. That's And now we see their success today. So no mm -hmm. question there. Um, so Carlo, um, now you've, you've come with so much experience, 
um, partnering with large enterprise companies like IBM along the way. Um, how has that experience shaped the way that you view these smaller startup, sol- uh, smaller software companies? Well, uh, you know, I think at the end of the day, um, channel is uh, is a necessity. And it's a necessity for whether you're a small or a large vendor. It's a necessity because they have the customers. That's 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 really the point, right? Um, you know, if you're especially if, if you're a small vendor, you have a new technology, you're very proud of it, you want to go and place it everywhere, but you don't have the relationships. And really, like I was saying earlier, this is just a game of relationships, and it's a it's a game of friendships, you know. And uh, the reason why channel exists, and look at the big the big numbers, right? So back in the day, um, when channel started, which was really in the late 80s, early 90s, um, because before then, there was just mainframes and there was armies of top level salespeople that were direct salespeople from IBM and didn't go and sell the mainframe, right? Um, the, the channel started later. And then within 20 years, about two thirds, maybe seventy percent of the world's uh, tech uh, business was transacted through through partners. Only a minority really was done through direct sales. Right nowadays, even more. If you look at uh, Forrester's latest uh, um, predictions, um, they predicted that that uh, uh, channel was going to be accountable for ninety percent of uh, um, of uh, transactions in terms of uh, uh, there'd be partner assisted transactions. So the prediction right now is that the, uh, the is that uh, um, we'll have less partners invoicing the end users. There'll be more, an increase in invoicing of the end user by the vendor, but that would never happen if it wasn't for the partner making it happen. So that partner involvement is increasing to 90%. This is unprecedented. Right, so everybody needs a partner. The reason why everybody needs a partner, uh, or many many partners, is because they already have the trusted advisory type of role. Those relationships with uh, with the end users, and think about it. It's the same. Uh, the, you know, whether you're talking about the big enterprise or mid market company, it's not too different to your own personal circumstances at home or in your family. If uh, you're looking to invest in a new uh, in a new technology for your family, even if you want to buy a new TV, you'll talk to somebody that you think might have an idea as to which is a good TV to get. Hey, what do you think about the new OLEDs? Are they better than the QLEDs? What's the difference? I don't know, right? And there's always one person, at least, in your ecosystem that you think you can rely on a little bit more to help you make that decision. And that uh, that is no different to uh, a bank uh, buying a new banking system worth tens of millions of dollars, right? At the end of the day, you need to have your trusted advisors. And that's what partners do. They made a business out of it. They, they are there to advise, to consult, to help companies on an ongoing basis um, to become smarter with their utilization of technology. And, and the reason why, why we need partners is because they have those relationships, because these relationships can only occur at a personal level, at a local level, right? And more often than not, at a, a, you know, a, on a face-to-face basis, yeah. So now, of course, you know, with uh, with technology moving as it does, with Zoom uh, and uh, the ability for us to have everything so much more, um, you know, from an electronic standpoint, everything is moving quicker. But at the end of the day, uh, the actual limiting factor, in a sense, but it's actually the enabling enabling factor, is that personal relationship that the uh, that the end users have with the channel partners. So I think that that's a really, really important point to make. And I think any vendor, large or small, will need, needs those relationships. I see that continuously. Um, I've worked closely, I've had the privilege to work closely, not only with IBM, but also with Microsoft, also with Cisco, also with HP, uh, with uh, a bunch of very, very large uh, vendors. And I've seen their uh, joy at using um, the relationships, uh, at working the partner the channel partners from um, from a, really from the personal relationships from that standpoint. So you mentioned IBM in your question to me. I remember IBM was making a big transition at one point because th- that's the other paradox is that we we always want to be so much more automated and then we we always we always retract back into realizing that it's a people business and it's it's based on people relationships. 
and uh, also from a, the standpoint of partners, it's it's not rare, it's not always that bigger is better, right? So uh, with IBM, they had come to me with a realization that they said, you know, we discovered Carlo. There's so many partners that we just never knew existed. Um, you know, they, they they gave me the example of uh, a gentleman and his dog in a farmhouse in uh, the middle of uh, of the countryside in Britain that was actually landing some of the biggest deals be, just because that person was highly networked within uh, a particular industry, the finance, banking, and insurance industry. And because of those very strong relationships, he was able to be extremely influential. So he didn't have a, a bench of technicians, but it, it didn't matter. It wasn't necessarily that kind of partnership. That's the other thing, is that we assume that partners are only transacting partners. Uh, the, the ones that actually resell. But there, there are so many different kinds of partnering relationships that we all need to consider. We need to consider um, the implementation partner type of relationship, the ones that you know, maybe they don't transact. Maybe you, for example, you bought Salesforce, you bought it uh, online, uh, but then you need to go and, have, and configure the damn thing to make it work. And for that, you need an army of consultants that are gonna come and you know do a design, work through the system, uh, run a, a trillion workshops with all of your departments and create a, a CRM that is actually useful for you. So the implementation partner is a kind of partner. There's there, uh, In an ecosystem, you need to consider how many of those you need, where you need them, and why you need them, and how you're going to compensate them, and how you're going to animate them, and how you're going to keep them happy. Then you have the transacting partners, the ones that actually either shift box or shift licenses. They have a different dynamic, and then, and then, uh, yet again, there's the influencing partner, or the specifying partner, and uh, that that's the example that comes back to the farmhouse in in, in England, uh, where this uh, amazing partner would just land the biggest deals, and and what IBM was saying at that point was, wow, we really need to rethink it because we hadn't really thought about these guys. How many more of these are there in the world? How are we going to go about identifying where they might be? And how do we go about making sure that, that they become our best friends? And that's a whole new layer of channel strategy. So when we talk about partner ecosystems, we're really talking about all of these different kinds of, of, of partners. Um, and furthermore, uh, again, looking at uh, what Forrester has been saying lately, um, they're considering um, agencies, now to be potential partners they're considering uh uh of course isvs have always been uh had the dual role of being a vendor and a partner at the same time and that's a huge market um uh consultants uh bank managers uh there's so many different kinds of entities that could could be considered part of your overall partner ecosystem and so therefore you know today Formulating a partner, a channel strategy is is a real big job. It's really, really complex, but it is to, so worthy of attention. Um, and I cringe every time I uh, see vendors, uh, you know, cut through the whole thing, ignore it, think that it's just a case of finding a couple of uh, resellers here and there, uh, and and you know that it's sufficient to spin up a portal uh, with without ha actually having a, a well thought out strategy. You know. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for sharing. So it you know it seems like at the end of the day, no matter how big the company is, it all comes down to people and those those relationships. Um, yeah. Yeah. So thanks thanks for sharing that. Um, so Jill, I'm going to hand it off over to you a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. So how have you seen? the smaller and mid-size channel companies or companies using their channel, how has that evolution changed to where nowadays smaller and mid-size vendors can take advantage of the new technologies that we have today and really rely on channel as their go-to-market strategy? Well, I'm, <clears throat> I'm not sure I'm going to answer exactly what you asked because I'm not sure. It, it's, it's kind of a wide topic that you've been asking, but from a, a technology perspective, and given the breadth of things you have to put in place to have a successful partnership program, um, I mean, to the 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 a full fledged partner program to give you an ID has, I think, about ninety one dimension in it. It may have been expanded a little bit to north of a hundred different touch point, different areas. 
uh, that a company is going to have to put in place to be considered to be really, really channel savvy, right? And address all the partner needs and all the different kinds of partners, as Carlo was mentioning. I'll, I'll, I'll make a little segue, uh, uh, a little uh, parenthesis here as to what Carlo was saying. What's really interesting, because of the example that Carlo was uh, taking, is in the evolution of partnership. And remember, at the beginning of this, I was saying, you know, it's it's. Uh, oh no, that was even before the the webinar started. I was saying that everybody equates a partnership and ecosystem and channel with resale, right? And even though it's still very important and it's still there, the focus of companies that are becoming extremely savvy in their partnership ecosystem is not so much longer on the front end and back end rebates, which is the, the, the main thing that drives a transactional uh, channel uh, or the main thing that used to drive, I should say, a transactional channel. The reason is for every dollar that's gonna be spent today, uh, on your license as a vendor, uh, uh, a channel savvy or a partnership savvy vendor will generate anywhere between four, five, six, and upwards of that dollars of revenue that is going to be to the benefit of their partners. And those are the integration partners Carlo was talking about, the uh, design partners, the consultants, and so on, and the services partners the education partners, all those kind of things, right? Um, Salesforce is actually, uh, Salesforce, I would take Salesforce and Microsoft I, uh, as being the absolute king of doing this, right? Um, Microsoft is generating trillions of, a trillion dollar economy with their partners of things they don't get, well, not direct financial benefit from, but that's, is being triggered by the sales of Microsoft licenses, right? Salesforce does the same. Actually, Salesforce uh, sells their own licenses. It, it's not, they, they don't do the money, you know, transaction thing uh, that go through a partner and all that. They, they keep ownership of that. And that's the only thing they do. But I just, I just did it in the last company I was because we expanded some of the uh, services we had with Salesforce, started basic CRM and then, you know, added more services and other things that Salesforce does. Uh, and they introduce their partner immediately into this, right? And in return, what Carlo was saying is, is uh, can be expanded to this, right? Um, the benefit for the partners at this point is that, well, they have a portfolio of a ton of other solutions that they sell, right? And services that they can graft to this and expertise that they have in different areas and all that. Is the front-end and back-end margin still important? Yes, it is. Is it going to diminish to the benefit of the other thing they can do? Of course it is, right? And that transition is already happening. And that's where the traditional partner program with your margin up front and this and that, it's not as relevant today as it used to be in the past, right? What's interesting for a vendor today, and you asked me before the question, what was the problem 20 years ago for the, vend for the, for the partners, right? That problem is no for the vendors, right? Now the vendors have to be relevant in addressing this for the partners. Partner of a selection mechanism today that is far more stringent than what the vendor used to have for the partners 20 years ago, right? And even for, and, 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 it, and as you can imagine, the smaller a brand is, the more difficult it's going to be for you uh, unless you have a completely game-changing thing. But not everybody is a VMware that comes with the revolution of virtualization uh, every day out of all those new vendors that we see happening every day, every day, every day. They don't have the bandwidth to deal with that. You know, even the large, you know, your optives and, and, and all your large, you know, worldwide technology and all that, they have to be very selective as to who they're going to pick up and all that. A lot of it is based on trust and relationship and this kind of thing. A lot of it is going to be based on relevance and how much other dollars they can generate through the sale of this particular vendor, right? How does that tie to the other thing they do and so on and so forth? But going back to your question, uh, technology today is important because you can imagine with all the things that are happening, uh, the, the, way, uh, the way we communicate, the way we find information, digest that information, analyze that information, and so on and so forth. Everything is, is very, um, we have much less time to do all those type of things, right? Uh, you have to be far more reactive, even so pre uh, uh, proactive in the way you, you tackle all the data and the things you need to do and how you need to react to things. 
so the tooling is something very important, right? Uh, and all this kind of thing. Gorilla is a good example of it because they, they provide, at least from a marketing automation perspective, from what I've experienced, I know they do other things that I might not be familiar with, but from that, it's, uh, it's a tremendous value add that in your, when you think about your partners, you know, you have the ability to uh, your partner, you know, strategy. And even though the entire strategy of your company is important as you're going to launch your product and so on and so forth, you have to factor this from the beginning. This is a recommendation as to say, who's going to be tackling this, right? Who's going to be tackling that? And sometimes as Carlo was mentioning, you know, putting in place a team that is going to be able to do what a company like Gorilla or many others do today uh, is very costly, much more costly than going to a company that have done it a million times, uh, that have had failures and successes that knows what works and what doesn't and what are the pitfalls and those type of thing and provide you with the service of doing this. A company like Salesforce does that, right? Uh, they have this approach. They can consult with you ahead of you acquiring licenses and all that to have a sound CRM strategy, even a PRM strategy, even a marketing automation strategy because they have those tools as well and so on and so forth, right? And it's... it's um, the way I look at it from a startup scale up type of company or SMB even is that the time to the time to achieve what it is that you want to achieve by leveraging company that have that expertise, that have this visibility of, you know, companies like you that have done that with them before and that have been successful, therefore they're capable of replicating best practices and this type of thing, and advise you as, you know, to tell you what things you need to focus on, which way you need to go with things that have been proven true in the past because they've experienced that, because they've had positive, very good positive ROIs on these things is invaluable to me. Or you can build your own team. It's, it's much more difficult, right? So this aspect of technology as we use it in business today for me is extremely important, right? And, and time-saving, cost-saving, uh, accelerating go-to-market for smaller companies. After that, you may want to build your own team, that kind of stuff and all that. But if the vendors are smart, you'll be a customer for life. Yeah? You'll come to the dance and then you'll keep dancing. Right? Exactly. You and an if, I, if, if I can add, it's, uh, it's really going to be about carrying on. Uh, I think if we look at, um, we talked a little bit about the last 20 years. If we look at the next 20 years, it's going to be about investing more into the relationships, uh, into uh, the relationship management. And, and it's going to be both the electronic relationships uh, digital relationships as well as uh, as uh, a lot more of the in-person relationships because again it, when you look at uh, the numbers uh, the the Forrester forecast as I said is that 90% of business is going to be partner assisted over the next 10 years uh, but in terms of the transactions it's going to be a third a third a third a third will be direct a third will be through channel uh, transacting channel partners and uh, and a third will be through marketplaces and uh, I noticed that there's a question actually in the uh, Q and A about marketplaces and and um, like for example the AWS or the Google marketplace. And uh, the reality is that the marketplace business is right now growing from a negligible amount to what's going to be a third of the world's technology economy. So it's it's enormous. It's enormous. But many of uh, the end users you will talk to will say. Yeah, I'm, I, I can actually uh, choose my package out of the, uh, choose my solution out of the marketplace, but I need the partners to implement them. We see that all the time. We see that in every, in every shape, uh, way or form. We see on the AWS marketplace, for example, Jill and I were talking the other day about uh, uh, some encryption solutions that are available uh, for cloud on the AWS marketplace. These are incredibly, these are beasts to to actually uh configure and make them make them usable and make them your own within your system you know these are uh you know they, they, they can be transactions that are through the aws marketplace and it's very hard to configure right the right. speaking approach of splunk is not the easiest one yet exactly know? right so, right so there. yeah the, the the point i'm making is that uh partners are there to stay uh and, it, and i think if we look at the next 20 years it's going to be about about understanding the new needs of partners and the new needs of partners are going to be 
there's going to be less of a need, as, as uh, uh, Gilles was saying, it'll be less important to worry about back-end rebates. And, and front-end. And, right, right. It'll be more a case of education. You know, let's learn together. Let's uh, informing the partners, uh, giving them the tools to show to be um, the uh, to be valuable trusted advisors that are able to actually be um, thought leaders, right? So it's going to be a different kind of relationship, and that kind of relationship is going to cost a lot of money to build. Um, part of it will need to be done electronically. And again, as we talk about the future, I think that there's a big future in partner management. Um, in, in, de in developing the electronic side of it. So I think that there is uh, a, uh, 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 a lot of evolution that, that needs to occur, that will occur from a robotic pro process automation angle, because a lot of the tasks, even um, the partner sales management tasks and partner marketing tasks uh, and partner technical enablement tasks can actually be uh, automated in part through robotic process automation. I think that, the, the, that that needs to happen because the complexity and the whole the, the whole industry is it's going faster and faster and faster, and you'll need that. And partners will need to have very effective AI, essentially that they can interact with to resolve questions quickly, on, uh, just 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 uh, effectively and quickly. We don't have those tools; don't exist today. But that is one area which I I, I can guarantee is uh, going to make a massive change in the industry over the next 20 years. That's a, one of the areas that we need to see develop. Uh, but that shouldn't and will never replace uh, the, the human relationship, the face-to-face. -face. I think it will be really important for vendors to have you know, partner events, to have more partner events than ever before, in fact, because their strategic value is increasing to the to the point of, of, of uh, assisting 90% of of business. You cannot ignore that. You cannot leave it to chance. It has to be completely 100% part of the DNA of any corporation. And that's one of the things that we mentioned earlier with Gilles is that we, we talked about the importance of, of how the importance of everybody, every individual in, uh, of the company being uh, partner centric. Yeah, we, we, everybody talks about being customer centric. And of course, that's, that's, that's the center of the uh, bullseye. Um, but being partner centric is is uh, is mandatory now. You cannot not be partner centric. If you're not partner centric, your business will fail at some point. Um, it's just the way the the world is uh, shaping, in my view. Yeah, that's um, that was that was really insightful. Um, thank you for sharing all of that. Um, so, Carlo, I I will follow up a little bit with um, you know when it per pertains to technology um, and the different ways that companies like Gorilla can take advantage of technology um, to help and work with vendors and partners. Um, so what, what kind of things is Gorilla doing with technology to help uh, partners and vendors? Yeah, so, so from our standpoint, uh, we are um, focusing more and more on technology. We have actually acquired a software uh, company last year, um, a company that we felt really stood out in the field of uh, partner marketing automation through channel marketing automation, a company called Partner Pulse, uh, which completely stands out and it's uh, different from all of the other vendors in the business. Uh, it's different in the way that it, uh, um, it's, it's, it's very partner centric and it makes it easy and exciting for partners to want to interact with a vendor. That's one of the biggest problems right now with uh, partner facing technology is that partners are, are faced with so many different technology interfaces between themselves and their multiple vendors. Remember, most partners will have easily uh, 10, if not 20, or, or even hundreds uh, vendor relationships with, with some of the bigger partners that are more product uh, uh, transaction oriented. And it, it is impossible for a vendor to expect a partner to interact with them digitally on, 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 on all of those part, uh, platforms. You may have one or two of the key strategic ones that will work that way. What we do with uh, with our technology is that we actually make it really exciting and uh, and we incentivize, we drive that behavior and drive the behavior in such a way that the partner wants to and needs to really interact with uh, with uh, with with the vendors that uh, uh, within our ecosystem through our technology. So that that said, that that's a, a powerful start. Um, 
Beyond that, we have also been uh, investing into some AI, uh, specifically two, two kinds of uh, AI. The first was uh, a, uh, a concept of an AI chatbot uh, that would, uh, again, be the front end, if you like, of what I was mentioning earlier, the need for a robotic process automation to automate processes, backend processes, to make the channel more efficient. Now, at the front end, what you need is something that is relatable. And uh, currently, still today, the majority of the chat bots that you have on uh, online are really not very effective. And uh, they are, uh, we, we've all struggled with them. Uh, it's a variation of uh, being on the automated uh, phone system that says press one for this, press two for that. And it, it just doesn't cut it. Well, what we did is that we experimented with uh, with actually the world's um, best conversational uh, chatbot. Um, actually produced in the United Kingdom uh, with a sense of humor, as uh, Brits have. And uh, this uh, chatbot is, it was just absolutely phenomenal. We were developing it a few years ago. It was a little bit too early to introduce into the vendor community um, because uh, the backend systems weren't ready for it. I think the time will come again in the near future, um, probably not this year, but next year, I think that uh, uh, it'll be the right time to uh, re-engage with AI-driven chatbots that actually will give partners and customers and end users actually a, a phenomenal experience, a very interactive, engaging, and fun experience. The sort of chatbot that you will, uh, that, that you cannot, with our chatbot, you, you cannot uh, take it off course. Um, you cannot, uh, uh, you, you'll never receive an answer that says, sorry, uh, uh, we can't help you with that question. Right, it will. Uh, it, whichever kind of curve ball you throw at it, it will come back with something relevant, and it will serve it back in a witty fashion. So I, I think the future has RPA involved. It has a, a ton of AI. Um, we need to button up all of the backend processes and and really make that partner experience a lot better. Uh, we're committed at Gorilla to carry on investing in this type of uh, of technology. We're also looking at. Uh, at making it really easy for partners to um, launch marketing campaigns uh, and, and also to launch campaigns that are um, thought out from an artificial intelligence perspective. So we've been uh, um, working with a technology vendor that is able to, uh, to do two things, to actually stack rank uh, a, a, a reseller's install base in terms of the propensity to buy. Uh, so it's like a customer propensity to buy analysis. Um, and it's actually, uh, it's, a, it's an AI process. Uh, so it profiles all of the potential buyers according to the number of different uh, factors and serves them back up in terms of their actual propensity to buy. And we can do the same on end user data, on uh, prospective new customer acquisition. So we're very excited about these new innovations. Uh, and I think that, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, you know, we're playing in a tough market. It's a highly competitive market, but I think that uh, what we have done at Gorilla is always innovate. Um, since the since those early days of working with IBM on creating uh, partner ecosystems, um, driving five hundred million dollars per annum for IBM uh, single handedly with a very very uh, uh, effective team, um, driving ROI of uh, uh, like thousand x. Uh, the, these were phenomenal programs that we that we did, uh, and we're, we remain committed to using technology to its best uh, to carry on serving uh, uh, vendors in in a way that is uh, uh, groundbreaking. Awesome. So it, obviously, there's huge trends in automation, uh, both on the front end and on the back end. Um, but on the flip side of that, how do we see, or how are you incorporating service offerings? Um, alongside technology to strengthen these relationships. Yeah. So again, the uh, these things go together. They can only go together. Uh, we have uh, we found ourselves over the last decade uh, becoming the service component of a lot of different service com uh, software companies, because when a software company uh, um, installed a particular partner oriented software they uh, often really struggled to get it used by the partner community. And so therefore, Gorilla had a, blossom, a blossoming of its concierge business, which is whereby we actually uh, work with partners 
to help them make the platform more effective for themselves so that uh, the technology vendor um, is able to get a return on their technology platform investment. Without the service component, uh, that would fail. It's very, very difficult. Like I said before, it's very hard for resellers to participate in a company, in, in a vendor's technology platform uh, because there are too many of them. There are too many technology vendors, too many technology platforms. They all do the same kind of thing. Uh, too many, it's just, it's just not, not, not workable. The only way that this can work is if there is somebody that is a trusted advisor, a consultant like a Sherpa that will actually uh, make it worthwhile for the reseller, for the, for the partner to utilize that technology. And we are Gorilla, we, we know what makes partners tick. We know what they feel is a waste of time. And we know how to hold their hands to make their business more effective um, utilizing the vendor backend uh, uh, technologies. Awesome, thanks for that. Um, Jill, I'm gonna throw this question towards you. Um, now looking forward into the future, um, I know we've, we've done a good job at covering the past and the present. We've touched on the, some of the future. Um, what are the, the biggest challenges that you see coming um, with software vendors as we look forward? Um, so one of them is, uh, is tied to competition. Uh, and before I go a little bit deeper into that, I, I wanna explain something to everybody that when channel people or partnership people talk about competition, it's not the traditional competition that everybody sees, right? Um, the traditional competition that everybody sees, like if you're if you're BMW, your competition is Audi, Volvo, Volkswagen, you know, this type of thing. From a channel perspective, if you're a vendor, your competition is everybody else that is on the line card of that particular channel partner. Even if they sell keyboards and you're selling storage or you're selling cybersecurity, all these other vendors are your competition. Why? Because uh, the currency uh, that is being exchanged between partners and vendors is mindshare. And everybody has so many hours a day to work. And Carlo was talking about partners. I, I, know, I, I know a slew of channel partners or VARs uh, that are carrying, that are maybe 30 to 50 people companies and they are carrying in excess of 250 brands. I've been working with channels that are carrying in excess of 3000 brands, right? How do you expect these people and their vendor and their sellers, sorry, uh, to carry your brand day in, day out, insert you into the discussion, bring them to the dance as was mentioning, which is, you know, coined by uh, 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 Jay, uh, Mike Ben. Um, it, it's like, it, it's incredible. And when vendors talk to channel partners 20 years ago, today, and I assume in the future, they have this tunnel vision there. They see the relationship between them and the partner without looking at the other thing that a partner is doing with all the other vendors and what. Carlo was mentioning it when using the tool. If every single one of these vendors come with their own PRM to a channel partner, and say, you have to use my PRM, not the other guy's PRM, right? Not, not an aggregator solution that could tap into all this. That would be great uh, ID for entrepreneurs out there. You know, it, it's like, it, it's crazy, right? You, you just see this relationship in your tunnel vision and you don't realize that you're competing with every single logo that is there, right? And that there's an element of, of uh, relationship, a very strong element of relationship that is going to define who they spend more time with, but there is, of course, elements of relevance based on front-end and back-end margins still today, but in the future, how much adjacent sell your product, your solution, your service, whatever it is that you're promoting through them is going to help them promote from the other lines they're carrying or from their internal capabilities as well, right? And, and this was a problem in the past. It's a problem today. It will be a problem tomorrow. As long as people have, have vendors don't have a little bit more empathy and understand our partner's function, you know, it's, it's, they're going to hit a wall every time, every time on this. So that, that's one of the problems that I see today. And this is why I'm talking about competition. Uh, that mindshare thing is, is critical, right? 
the problems that I've observed in the past and that are coming in the future are still the same, right? Uh, for the rest, it's that channel readiness thing. It's uh, people still think they can go to par and say, look, we do great thing, this, this, and that. And they have nothing ready. I was mentioning about a hundred dimension uh, when you want to have a partner program that is really efficient and really mature. You don't have to tackle the hundred of them, but there's a baseline readiness that you need to have. And, and for everybody that is interested, I'm way, way willing and Carlo is as well to talk about this outside of this webinar that is coming to an end. But uh, you have to be a baseline, um, have a baseline of readiness that you're going to come to your partners, whatever your partners are doing for you, you're going to be able to show them that you've done your due diligence to understand what they do, how you can best serve them, how you can support them, uh, that you understand their verticals, their markets, their customers, that you bring value, uh, value add to what it is that they're doing, that you can multiply their sales, that you can help them with a bunch of things. Uh, you, you have to have a bunch of things ready. If you don't have these things ready, and I've seen many, many companies, some I work for, some, you know, by just observing, some I consulted with, that this channel readiness thing, they are light years away from it, right? So these are, for me, are the, 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 the two things, right? The uh, increase and explosion of vendors that makes the market very crowded and channel readiness are the two things. Okay. Thanks, Carlo, man. I see you, you've got your hand up. Do you have anything to add to that real quick? Yeah, I do, because um, uh, I just wanted to, we've been uh, addressing the questions kind of as we went along. Uh, there's one question uh, in the Q&A that I thought I wanted to pick up on from Steve McLaughlin uh, around uh, um, understanding uh, partners. And uh, essentially the question is about partner intelligence. And I think this is really important. Um, there's many answers to that. Uh, we have very limited time, but what we do effectively is, um, is uh, our philosophy is uh, scorecarding partners. And we have two ways of scorecarding partners, static and dynamic scorecarding. Static scorecarding is when you look at all the parameters and the characteristics of a partner that you'd really like and you score partners against those. Part of that scoring can be done electronically, part of it is done manually. And then it's presented back to you on an interface where you can see uh, which are the partners that are most valuable to your company, even if they're really hard to recruit. And then on a different uh, dimension, you see the partners that are easy to recruit, even, even though they might not be the most strategic fit. And then you work along these two coordinates to find that happy medium uh, that can help you grow your channel. Um, and uh, with regards to dynamic scorecarding, what I wanted to say there is uh, it's really important that that's what gives you the pulse of the partners as you go along in the relationship. And what you do is that you monitor all the KPIs that are vital. One of the KPIs that is the most vital, in my opinion, is the ratio of marketing pipeline to sales quota, even for the unmanaged partners. And now when you monitor that, it's really vital. And you'll see that it, it, it always fluctuates according to where you are in the quarter. But what's important and what are uh, what partner polls can do, for example, and you can build your own system that can do that same thing, is the, the concept is the exception reporting so that it flags and gives you an alert every time there's an exception occurring on a partner. So when that KPI goes outside of a, of a range of acceptable uh, numbers, uh, the channel manager gets a notification and then you can, you can immediately uh, jump in and assess uh, uh, that relationship. But I know we're at the top of the hour, so I'll hand it back right back over to Ted. Okay. Well, um, you know, thank you for sharing that. Um, I'm, I'm glad we got to that question real quick. Um, but yeah, I'm going to wrap this up. So thank you both Carlo and Jill um, for all the insight you guys shared with us today for helping us understand how the channel has evolved um, and how startups and vendors of all sizes can utilize different channel models, models to multiply their revenue, to grow to the market stronger and to gain that ever coveted mindshare. Um, so thank you everybody else for attending. If you guys have any more questions or you'd like to learn more about Gorilla Partner Pulse or developing your own channel ecosystem, I encourage you to reach out to webinar at gorillaict.com. Um, and we would also like to invite you to attend our cybersecurity and safety um, in the Internet of Things webinar hosted by the Torta Breda Institute for Partnership Excellence. That's happening later today. That's at 4 p.m. Pacific time. And the link to register um, will be posted in the chat window for everybody. Um, and with that, I wish you all a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks again.